Hi, everyone. So I'll get the uh, class started. Just one second, actually. All right. So today's lecture will be on token classification and ER, MRC, and attention. What? Just a second. Okay, my iPad froze. It's really annoying. There we go. All right. So today's outline. So I'll be making a few announcements and then I'll briefly go over the exploding and vanishing gradients that we didn't have time to go over last week. Then uh, we'll be briefly talking about a few other problems, including long-term dependency problem that RNNs have. And to account for this, I'll recap why we need LSTM. Then I'll be going through a really quick tour of Jupyter Notebook so that you can be familiar with how to use PyTorch in case you haven't, and you will need, you will need this for your assignment. And then we'll be moving to token classification which is oftentimes used for tasks such as part of speech tagging, name entity recognition, and machine reading comprehension, and many other tasks actually. So this is a very powerful tool, very powerful framework, uh, not framework, I would say it's more of a formulation. And lastly, I'll briefly mention why we need attention, not just LSTM to do really better understanding of language Okay, so announcement, sorry about the delay. So it was supposed to be actually last Wednesday and it's been delayed for about a week. There were some issues, but um, we will release the assignment one today, but please don't worry about the deadline. We'll give you at least two weeks. Number two is that the assignment will consist of uh, some math questions and part towards coding for text classification. This is same. And the assignment will be due on March. 31st, two weeks from today. And there is actually one more announcement that I think originally I mentioned that we will have two coding assignments and two written assignments, writing assignments. But at the moment, it looks like we'll not have enough time to do a lot of writing. Uh, so I'll be giving you three coding assignments instead of two, or two, uh, two coding and one writing assignment. So number of assignments in total will be the same. It's just that the one, the first writing assignment will be replaced with a coding assignment, and it will be about token classification. So this will be on that number four was writing assignment. Will be instead coding. Okay, so a bit of recap and talking about exploding and vanishing gradients. So I, I believe now all of you are pretty familiar with this diagram. This is diagram of recurrent neural networks. And as you see, the the really the interesting nature of recurrent neural net is that you're applying the same matrix or same weights instead of different weights at each layer. So that's why you can actually describe the model as a unfolding of one module, recurrent module. And we were talking about a few problems with the RNNs and one of the really core problems of just using vanilla RNN is that the gradients can explode pretty well or vanish. So I'll be giving you a very uh, quick sketch of what this means, why this happens. So 
again, I think we talk about this briefly, but um, some of them will be recap. Some of them will be relatively new. So we'll be using V for the recurrence and U for the input transformation. So, and here the, the nonlinearity such as 10 H is not displayed, but we'll assume that we have the nonlinearity so that we can model complex functions. So then we can write down HT is equal to some nonlinearity we'll use sigma to describe it. In this case, you can think of it as 10 H. And what was V? What was V? Okay. So v, you use U for the input and you use V for the previous time step hidden state and have a bias. All right. So, and then if we want to compute the gradient of this with respect to um, the previous time step hidden state. So um, why would you need to compute this? Because the loss will be a function of HT. So loss will be a function of, um, will be function of HT, right? Which means not just function, but actually um, in many cases, because you're applying this to, you're computing the gradient. So what that means is that if you wanna compute loss, then this will be proportional to, of course, the, DHT of uh, D theta. And the DHT of D theta, if you want to compute this, if you unfold the, the original function here, this one, then this will be basically exactly equal to, if you're assuming the HT is scale value, and V. So you might ask what happens if this HT is not scale value? So uh, it, it's very similar if you just go to a larger number of dimensions. So more formally, I'll just open the chat in, in, in case you have questions. So more formally, if this was, if uh, the, if the uh, we're operating in, dimension higher than one, if D is greater or equal to two, then it becomes simply just diagonal of U of XT plus V of HT minus one plus B and V. So in this case, of course, this is, will be matrix multiplication. So you can actually check yourself that um, the only difference is that you put a diagonal operation instead of nothing when you are going from one dimension to more than one dimension. And now what that means is if you keep doing this, right? Is it just a second? Yeah, so actually, my bad. Yep, so I have to put one more thing here, right? So this is just, you have to also differentiate HT minus one. So you have to multiply this all, right? And I'm saying that this part will be just replaced with this. Uh, this if you're operating in vector space. And here is the issue because if you are computing this all the way, 
then you will be just multiply, multiplying V several times, right? So what that means is at the end, when you're computing, this is chain rule. So you're computing this gradient again. So you, you have this number, right? So now you have to compute HT minus one over D theta. And this will be again, something like that. And then you have V here again, and you have HT minus two, right? So you keep doing this. So at the end, now you see that you're basically multiplying V several times. So at the end, what that means is, dht over d theta will be proportional to v of well, v to the power of t minus one. And of course, this t will be very large if the sequence, the text sequence is large. So if v is smaller or smaller than one, actually not equality, because if it's equal, then of course it'll be one. One then, the problem is V of a T minus one will be really small, right? And of course, if this is bigger than one, then V of T minus one will be really big. Or I mean, absolute value of that will be. So that's the, this is this vanishing part. And this is the exploding part, right? So here is the, reason why this happens. So, so I, my suggestion is that always think of it in the one dimensional space first, and then generalize that into multi-dimensional space because operating it with the matrices is very complicated. So one of the possible solution for exploding gradient is actually called gradient clipping. And it's quite simple. So because the gradients are too large, so why not just make it smaller by just dividing that by a certain scale of value? So what that means is that if gradient is bigger than C, so when I'm saying bigger, I'm, I'm talking about the norm of the gradient is bigger than C. So we perform if gradient is bigger than or equal to some C value, then let G is equal to C times G over absolute value or the more norm of G, then what will be the new G's scalar? It will be simply Well, because your multiple your your norm here, this is one, right? If you just divide G by its norm, then it'll be always one. So this will be just C, right? So it's good because now if your norm was bigger than C, then you made it into a norm of C. So this is like one of really the simplest trick that you can do when your gradient is exploding. And when you're training your model, probably during your assignment, you will see that you your gradient might be exploding a lot if you, especially if you use RNNs. So there are several solutions. One of the solution is actually gradient clipping, but um, I think I mentioned in the last lecture that uh, really the LSTM also resolves this. So that's true that the LSTM also is good for not exploding the gradient. And you will be also asked to really um, mathematically really see why in the assignment, why this is the case. So that will be a, one part of your assignment, by the way. And another issue with RNNs is that the, the RNNs have, are not that good at long-term dependency. What that means is suppose that you have a, some information from very far away token. So if this text, then you might have a really long text where the subjective and the objective are very far away. I'm not subjective, but objective. Subject and object are really far away. In that case, that the object, of course, will need to be aware of what the subject was, but because it's too far away, your information was here, right? Suppose that the, um, yeah, so I'll put the 
let's say we are some t plus 10, really far away. And from the perspective of h t plus 10, the information of, about x t has been gone through a lot of transformation through v. So it is very likely that the information has been corrupted through several applications of V. And that's another problem with RNNs because there is no way that you can preserve XT in a neat way. So that's what people call long-term dependency problem. Your information gets distorted and also it goes through some transformation that it's very hard to keep over a long period of time. So these are the, uh, the real problems are an end and also the motivation for the development of LSTM, long short term memory. So we've been going through this and we spent a few minutes on this last week. I think I explained to you that it's not too much different from RNNs. You can see that, that, that there is a really big similarity between RNNs and LSTM if you look at the, the C part. So C tilde T is very similar to RNNs, right? And here the um, sigma C is something like 10H. And sigma G is gate activation function, which is oftentimes um, sigmoid. So here, is, this is usually sigmoid. And remember that sigma is always between zero and one. And sigma C is usually 10H. And that is between negative one and one. So that's very similar to the uh, vanilla RNN with, uh, of course, 10H activation. And I told you that the how the LSTM works is you want to control how much information you want to pass from the previous time step and how much you want to use the current time steps RNN output. So you can see that in this CT, not CT or T, but CT definition, as you see, your CT depends on the current C tilde T and the previous time step C tilde Z. So CT minus one, basically. And if you have a really high forget gate number, then that means you will not forget what you saw in the last time step. So you will pass everything to the current time step. And in that case, maybe your input gate I will be really low so that you actually just not use any information you obtain from the current time step. And note that this, these are all in vector space, not scale value. So you might forget some information in some dimensions, but you might uh, pass some information in some dimensions too. So you will be using uh, different dimensions with different goals. And finally, you have uh, another round of um, nonlinearity and output gate to really process it as one more time. So you might think, why would you need to do this twice, right? Like, why, why, why don't you just use the CT as the output instead of the HT? And actually that simplification was the main motivation for GRU. Although we'll not go through, go into this in detail, but uh, I'll put, uh, put a link on the schedule so that if you're interested, take a look at that. So you will see that the definition of GRU is very similar to LSTM. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's fine for now, but you can think of it as more simplified version of LSTM that requires less computation and but still has the similar functionalities that makes LSTM pretty good at long-term dependency and also vanishing gradients. Okay, so Oh, we're good with that. And there, there are several other tricks that you can use to make the text understanding better for your text classification. One of the uh, popular ways is bidirectional RNNs. Here, RNNs, actually, when I say RNNs, I mean the all, 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 all variants of RNNs too. So LSTM is also a variant of RNN. So, when I just say RNNs, now, now, uh, now on, you can think of it as anything that's using RNN architecture as the um, fundamental fundamental building block. 
I'll use vanilla RNN to refer to the very first RNN that I talked about. So bidirectional RNNs mean that you can use bidirectional LSTMs, bidirectional GRUs, et cetera. And the idea is pretty simple. So the RNN is unidirectional. So you cannot look, you cannot, you cannot, your, your information is always dependent on the text before your current time step. But you might also want to look at what happens after the after current time step in order to understand the text. So you just have two RNNs in opposite directions. So it's something like this. You have the forward RNNs, right? And then, of course, you will have some output here. Right. And I'll use the forward direction to indicate this HT for the forward. Then you can do the similar thing in the opposite direction. And it's exactly the same, except that the arrows are the uh, opposite directions. And your final hidden state will be something like, there are several ways of concatenating these two RNNs. One simple way is just add them. Another way is that you can concatenate them. where the semicolon is the concatenation function. Of course, if you concatenate, then your dimensions will be now twice. So that's something you need to be careful about. Another application, of course, is also obvious, relatively obvious application is nowadays, is that you just stack several layers. So in that case, then you have, I'm assuming unidirectional layer uh, RNN here. So suppose, you have uh, your first layer hidden states. Then you just pass this as the input for the second layer. And use the same architecture to compute the RNNs, but you might all, of course uh, want to have a different parameters instead of same parameters to train the second layer. Usually we use different parameters instead of sharing the parameters. Then your hidden state in the second layer can be obtained. Oh, sorry, it's two, it should be two, right? And then you just do whatever you want with the second layer hidden state instead of the first layer. But, but there are also methods that instead of um, Using just a second hidden state, you also use the first hidden state by defining the hidden state to be in the same way as the bidirectional RNN summation of both. And this is actually very useful if you want to avoid um, gradient vanishing or exporting problems. And also when you wanna train really deep neural nets, it's called skip connection. My writing is bad. I'll not be going into details for now, but this is very simple, right? It's very simple. Just you add your, for the higher layers, you add the output from the lower layers. It's a very simple idea, but its implication is very large. It was the, uh, the really the most important part when people try to create very deep neural nets, such as ResNet in 2016. And also this was applied in transformer BERT so that they can build really deep neural nets without having the problem of gradient issues. And another 
trick. It's not really trick about the RNNs. It's really more of generic trick. It's regularization trick that it prevents model from overfitting and all it's called dropouts. Although this has been used a lot in the image classification as well, and also was actually originally proposed for image classification, image task, but dropout especially proved to be very useful, very, very useful in text domain. So for instance, BERT used both dropout and layer norm. Dropout is very powerful. And I think in NLP, the introduction of dropout was really crucial to make it work really well. It's especially more useful than other regularization tricks such as L2 regularization that was more useful in the image, but was not so as effective in the NLP domain. And what dropout is, is that it's very simple. During training, you just nullify some dimensions in each vector. So suppose that your RNN has 100 dimension output state. So your RNN has this hidden state, suppose it's our real number of 10 dim 100 dimensions. Then you just sample 20 dimensions for this hidden state and just make them zeros during training. Of course, during inference, they are not nullified, but during training, you just zero them randomly and then just keep training. And it turns out that this prevents the model from overfitting. And it's uh, very effective. You will see also, this is very effective when you're doing your first assignment. Okay, so I'll spend a few minutes to go over a few things you will need to know to the assignment that's uh, covering some basics of PyTorch, just in case that some of you are not familiar with the PyTorch. So the Jupyter notebook that I'll be showing you will be shared online after the class. It'll be very brief though. Um, just a second. So stop sharing. Okay. All right, so I'll be very quickly going over what we discussed up to now in our four lectures or 4.5 lectures, what they mean if you want to write them in code. So we talked about tokenization. I hope you remember that. So suppose that we have a text, hello world. And the simplest tokenization you would do is you have text, hello world, and then you obtain tokens by splitting text into several tokens with some Delimiter here, I can use space. And if you print tokens, then you will see that you have two tokens, right? Hello and world. And we need to construct a vocab to do anything with the neural nets and using these word embeddings, right? So um, now then we need to create a list of words that you saw or list of tokens you saw during training. That's like a, the easiest way you can construct vocab, but sometimes you want to use text that's not in your target data, training data, but also that those words, those text corpus that's found wild, that's not being used for your target data. So for instance, let's say you want to train for text classification or sentiment classification of movie reviews. Then in that case, the easiest way that you can create your vocab is that look at your training data, all the text. So here I'm just using one text, but you can see that if I have several texts, you can just 
concatenate them, or I mean, you can extract tokens from each text and then just make them into set. And then after that, you can flatten them, right? To make a really large list of vocab. But the problem with this approach will be that you'll be only able to put words that you have seen in your training data, but there will be words that you haven't seen in the training data that appear during inference time, right? So what people sometimes use is that they instead go to large Wikipedia corpus and then use the tokenizer to obtain all the words and use that as the vocab. So in the assignments, you will not be asked to actually do that directly. You'll be only using your training data to create the vocab. Of course, text will be much longer or in other ways, text will not be just single text, but it will be list of text. And you need to split that and then create a set and list, list make it into a flat list. And you also need to have a word to ID mapping because you want to, when you're given a word, you want to access its ID really fast. And then if you print this vocab and word, word to ID of hello, then you will see that your vocab will be just two word vocab of hello and world. And um, if you try to map hello and then try to find its a word ID, then you will see it's zero. But now you might think here, why are you, um, not, why aren't you separating between exclamation mark and world? And is it okay that we have the capitalization uppercase here? And the answer is probably not. You might want to normalize text so that you can also map, for instance, H to index zero. But what will happen if I do this right now? It will just give you error, right? Because you don't have hello with the lowercase in your vocab. So you might want to do some normalization in your assignment to make this more robust. Another method that you can use is we can instead utilize pre-built vocab and embedding instead of building yourself using the Wikipedia. So those are, the examples are things like word to vec glove, et cetera. In the assignment, you'll be asked to use glove. You will see it's really hard, easy to use. Actually, the glove is just a, um, just CSV file with words listed, it's all lowercase, and you have a vector on the, on the right. So you can just create an index of these words and use the vector that corresponds to each word as your input for your neural network. And then, so, but now let's come back to our building the word embedding from scratch. So if you want to create your word own word embedding, then you'll basically import NN from Torch, and then you will define your vocab lengths. In this case, of course, you define vocab already, so you just have to compute length. And suppose the dimension is very small for now. Of course, this is usually uh, much larger, something like in glove, you'll be using something like 100 dimension up to 300. Uh, BERT nowadays, something like, and it might go bigger with other language, much larger language models. So when you, if you define embedding and then that embedding with NND, this basically creates a weight inside this module or parameters that you can train. So if you actually, just a second. So if you actually use this embedding and then you look up with your input tensor, so input tensor will be corresponding to the index of the word of the input. So suppose that your input was hello world. Then if you put this into the vocab and make them into IDs, then this will be just zero and one, right? Because hello is right now corresponding to 
the first first word in the vocab and world is corresponding to the second wo word in the vocab so it will be just zero and one and then if you put this into the embedding then you will see that your vector your output will be so two by three matrix right so what does that mean this is two by three because this vector, the first vector here in this matrix corresponds to the vector corresponding to hello or the zeroth word. And this vector is corresponding to the vector for the second word. And now you have a matrix of the input and you'll put this into your RNNs or maybe something other than RNNs to do your text classification. And of course, implementing RNN will be your assignment, so I'll not be discussing that in details, but perhaps one really um, very simple way of applying neural nets on this will be just using linear transformation, right? You remember that linear transformation is just a single layer of neural net with multiplying a matrix and adding a bias to that. So you can apply that. So if you have this, then you can apply, you can create your weights with this code, and then you can apply this linear transformation on top of the output of the embedding module. So, So then you will see that your output will be now two by four matrix, right? So actually you can also do this. You print out and you can print also out the size. Now you see that your output has two by four. So this one is actually batch size. So that means that it's just, you have a, several, you have one example of this. We're talking about one example, right? So it's by default at the, at the front. And now you have two here because you have a two words, right? Two words and four is the output of this linear transformation that was applied on top of this embedding output. So you transform the dimension from three to four by multiplying a matrix and also adding a bias to it. But note that this doesn't include the activation function, so you will have to define your activation too. For instance, if you want to um, use ReLU, then you can also do something like this. Then you will see that now everything will be zero if this is negative, right? Activation nullifies all non-negative values to zeros. Okay, so hopefully. This was a good introduction of um, how you will be using PyTorch to, for your assignments. Okay, so we have now about 38 minutes left in this class. So let's go back to our slides. Oh, my bad. So actually I'll just go through one more slide and do a three minute break. So up to now, you, we have been talking about text classification and I believe every one of you now know what that means. It means that you're trying, you're given a sequence of words, which is text and you put this into a neural network and you classify this entire text into a few categories. That category might de will depend on the target task. If you're doing sentiment classification, then your categories might be just, no, number of categories might be just two, positive or negative. Maybe you want to do more complicated thing. Maybe you want to classify the text into a score between one and 10, then you have 10 categories. But in any case, when you're doing text classification, you're mapping the text into one of the 
10 categories, the entire text. But when we move to token classification, this is also known as sequence tagging. So um, if you have heard of sequence tagging, I mean the same thing. In that the, the core difference is that unlike text classification, you classify each token of the text, which means if you were in, your input was hello world, instead of classifying the entire hello world into something, you classify hello into something and world into something. So it's more fine grained task than text classification. So you might have two questions, right? Then why would you do it? That's number one. And number two is how do you do it? So it turns out that once we move to token level classification from text level, the range of task you can accomplish becomes much wider and the tool will be very much stronger than the text classification itself. So we'll see what we can do with that after the break. So that's what we're gonna discuss. So let's take a just three minute break so that I can have uh, some time to drink water. Yep, come back in three minutes. All right, so let's begin the second part of the class. So as you saw, token classification, we wanna know why would you do that? So what kind of tasks can we do with token classification? And once we are convinced that token classification is a useful tool, then how can we do that? But before that, I'll be describing a bit about 
through a schematic the difference between token classification and text classification in general using RNNs. So in text classification, you basically have some text, right? So you have a T tokens as an input after tokenization and through the embedding, um, they go into this some recurrent neural nets. And then you have a hidden state at every time step. And one of the most common way of obtaining the vector that summarizes the entire text is using the vector from the last hidden state. So this HT, right? H of big T. That's one method. Another method is they you do some pulling from all hidden states from the all time steps. So basically you either use HT for the classification or you pull something like, for instance, you can do something like average pulling you divide by one over T of the summation of all HT for classification. But in either case, what you use for the classification is a single vector. And this is a label that you give to the entire text, right? But in token classification, what you wanna do is instead, you might have the same input But instead of having one categories in text, I mean one, no, I mean you, instead of having, instead of categorizing the entire text in text classification here, for instance, you know, positive, negative, neutral. In token classification, you're classifying each token into some classes. So what would be on one example that does this? One popular example is actually part of speech tagging. So have you heard of it? Hopefully you have, but if you have not, it's fine. So what that does is that you try to determine what the role of each word is in each sentence. So for, the, I think in high school or middle school, we learned that each word in the sentence has some role, grammatical role. So for instance, in English, the will be determiner. And here, for instance, he is like a proper noun. And we have verbs, we have other nouns, noun phrases, etc. So, and you see that when you are given a word in the dictionary, there are only few possible roles that the word can be, but there can be more than one role. So for instance, what would be the good instance here? So if you look at the hand, there are two possible roles the hand can have. One is noun phrase because hand is a noun, right? My hand, your hand. But hand can be also a verb because you hand in something to someone. Hand can be a verb that represents certain action. So that's why it has two kinds of classes it, that the word hand can be. And that's why the problem is not trivial because the, the role of the word can differ depending on the word's context. And hand might have only two possible roles, but some cases like outside, it has four roles, possible roles. So, but the truth is that in a given sentence, the word can have only one role. So in this sentence, the role, the true, the, the, the true role of outside in the sentence is RB. So as you see, uh, 
each word can have different roles and this is exactly a classification problem, right? And of course, you know, the number of possible tags or categories that each word can belong to differs depending on different linguists and different, um, I would say, ways of describing the language itself. So even for the same language, which is English, people have different ways of defining these part of speech. But whatever that is, it, of course, number is not like super large. It's usually, if it's really large, it can be up to like 100. But if it's a small set, then it can be something like 30, 20. So the problem that becomes given a sentence and you're given how you would tokenize sentence that you want to know what each word correspond, correspond to among the given categories of part of speech. And this can be useful in many um, downstream applications if you want to know if certain word is a verb or not. Maybe a, a bit more, a bit more, uh, a, a, a test that might be more used to you is a name entity recognition, which is about finding person, organization, or location in a sentence. So in this example, as you see, Jeff Masters is a person. That's why it's red. And whether underground is organization. So you want to mark this with organization and Arma is person, which might not be obvious, right? I mean, I, ha I haven't heard of a person named Arma so many times, so it's very unfamiliar, right? And Cuba is a location here. And as you see, this could be also quite ambiguous because sometimes Cuba might be a person, right? So this is, this is also why name entity recognition requires some machine learning to resolve this ambiguity that might happen, that has happened in part of speech tagging as well. But now you see there's a bit of difference if you wanna approach named entity recognition that differs from part of speech tagging, which is in POS tagging, you are asked to only classify each word. But here, now you see that you're not just being asked to classify each word, but you want to actually extract the entire named entity. And that could be a prob problem because what if you have two words, two persons back to back? Then, for instance, what if Jeff Masters is not a single pers person, but two people names are written back to back? Then you want to ex you want to be also be able to separate these two, right? So that's why people have come up with what's called biotagging or IOB tagging. So the idea is really simple, though. Um, while the name might not be familiar, it is quite simple. Suppose that we want to do named entity recognition on this sentence, Barack Obama was the president of the United States. And really the thing is, if you want to do named entity recognition and we want to do that through the token classification, we want to classify each word into one of categories, right? And the categories here will define to be person, organization, and location. But some words not be none of these, right? So we'll define O here. And for person, each word is either the first word of the entity, or it might be intermediate word, or by uh, which means non-first word. So that's why we categorize this into two categories, which is B of person and I of person. And we do the same thing for the org. Each word of org is either the first word or the second, second and the third and all other words. And same thing for the location. So how many categories do we have here? 
we have two categories for each. So we have two classes for each person organ lock, right? And we have one O for um, at the end. So basically, let's say if we want if we want to classify n entities types. That means we will have two n plus cl one classes. So what we want to do is then, in this case, it will be seven, right? So we want to classify each word in the input sentence into the seven categories. So here, Barak is an entity and person entity, and it's the beginning of the Barack Obama entity. So this will be. B O P, and Obama is also a person entity, but it's not beginning, so this will be I O P, and was will be O right? It's not nothing. Da is also O, president is also O, of is O, da is O, United States is a location, and United will be the first word. So this will be B of location, and states will be. I of location and the period, if we have good tokenizer to separate this from United States, will be O. So if you can create a model that can do this token classification after we have done that, it is clear that we can decode this sequence of tags into extractive, extracted entities, right? So this will be just one entity of person, this will be one entity of location. So it's a very useful tool that uh, is used in many different ways, not just named entity recognition, but it can be anything that you want to extract a span or several spans from the text. And one of other uh, tasks that has been quite popular in a recent uh, in the, in the recent days is machine reading comprehension, mainly because compared to the other, other tasks that I just described, MRC is more, I would say, intuitive and very application friendly. MRC or also called question answering, it's the terminology is very mixed up, I think. It's not, it's not super clear, but I will, use, I will use MRC for this case and QA for a marginal case. But in MRC, the task can be defined as you're given a context text and a question about the text. And then you have to predict what the answer to the question will be, where you're, you know that the answer will lie inside the text. So I think this setup is quite familiar to many of you who have gone through standardized tests, such as I would say Sunu in Korea, right? Um, and of course, SAT in the US and many different exams have something similar to machine reading comprehension. So here's an example, as you see on the right. So you are given text. This is text, right? And people also call this context. There are several words that describe this part. And you're given um, question one and answer one. You're given question two and you have to predict answer two and you have a question three and you need to predict answer three. So the question one, what causes precipitation to fall? And if you read the given text, you will see that water vapor that falls under gravity. So the answer will be gravity. And the second question, what is another main form of precipitation besides drizzle, rain, snow, sleet, and hail? And you exactly see that the answer is also granupol. Gra I don't know how to pronounce that. And lastly, where do water droplets collide with ice crystals to form precipitation? And you also see that it's within a cloud. So it's a bit different from NER, but it's not too different, right? Because similar to NER, you need to find a span in the text so you will need to categorize each token, whether it belongs to an answer or not. So you can approach in a similar way. But of course, there are several ways to de define the problem, right? Um, in NER, you, were, uh, you actually had 
several spans per text input. So the IO world might, could, could have been the best way to do that. But in question answering, you're guaranteed that you have only one answer for each question. So if you consider text and question as an input, you want to find a span that corresponds to the question, corresponds to the answer to the question. And that span can be uniquely defined by finding the start and the end point or end time step in the context, right? So in that case, then what you can do instead, you can formulate the problem as is that instead of doing biotagging, you can classify each token into start and, and others, right? So unlike biotagging here, now you are you have you basically have three categories to pretty uh, classify into. And if you can do this correctly, then I think we all agree that you have a good question answering system that works pretty well. So what would be a one possible way to design an MRC model or maybe any um, token classification model, right? And it's actually quite simple. We saw how we can create a token classification model in the previous slides. So we can just do the same thing. Suppose, but now one difference is that unlike the previous case, we have two inputs, right? Text and question. So there are several ways to handle this, but for now, one of the easiest way to handle those two is that you just concatenate them and hope that the model can do something with it. But you might want to differentiate between the text and question. So why don't we just put a, some special sp placeholder between them? So I'll put context here. I'm not saying this is the only way though. So I'm just showing one way to do this. And in your second assignment, you will be asked to create an MRC model and you're free to explore other things. So you have a, you have context here. So suppose that your text is something like, blah, 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 blah. blah. And then um, the tech context or the text ends here. And we want to put a space, a special placeholder. So um, it can be anything. Um, why not something like end, right? Just to indicate the text has ended here. And then put a question here. When was Boma born? And we can tokenize this text and put them into RNN. And note that we, we also use, we consider the special token and as an input as well. So suppose that we just, we just use unidirectional RNN. Of course, you might want to use bidirectional RNN, LSTMs, and also you might want to have several layers, but it's, uh, I think you all get the point. You can make this improvement without much difficulty. Then we'll have some hidden states coming out, right? H0, H1, H2, HK, for instance, HK plus one. And then what you want to do is you want to classify each hidden state into one of the three classes, right? Is this B, I, or O? I mean, not B, I, O. It's a start, and, or others. Start being is the start of the answer to the question? Is this end of the answer to the question? Or it's nothing else? So you classify each of them. So start, and or other start and or other in this case 
when was Obama born will be maybe somewhere here. So probably all these tokens will be classified into O and you might have in the middle, start somewhere here and maybe end here. And we clearly know that answer will not lie in the question, right? So we just ignore these. Then if we can have a model that can do this pretty well, then we're sure that we can get the model's prediction by decoding the output of these each token classes, right? Of course, there are several problems with this really vanilla model. One of them is that if you use green directional RNN, then these hidden states, H0, H1, H2, will not have any dependency on the content of the question. So they do not know anything about question. So then maybe we want to put question before the context, right? If you're using unidirectional RNN, so that because the question's information will be flowing through, through the later time steps so that um, when we are trying to predict the answer, we know what the question was. So that's like, those are the things that you might want to really improve upon. But um, I want to really indicate that RNN or even the LSTM is no more good enough when you're coming to um, MRC or similar tasks that has very long text. And that's exactly because to classify the start or end token correctly, the RNN at the time step you're looking at needs to be sufficiently aware of distant tokens. And that was very clear because if you want to be able to answer, if you want to know that, for instance, this word, I'll give an example. If you want to know that this word here within is the start of the target answer, then if you look at the question, where do water droplets collide with ice crystals to form precipitation? And you need to travel up to precipitation forms, right? But this precipitation forms, although it's in the same sentence, it's very far away in RNNs, right? It's like uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 words away from the, the target token that you're looking at. So if you want to be able to get the answer correct, then you want to make sure that information from 14 time steps in the, to the left has been correctly conveyed up to here, which is very difficult even with LSTM that we saw it has a good capability of long-term dependence with the gates. And you'll also see this in your second assignment that you actually get pretty poor score if you just use LSTMs because of the long-term dependency problem. And that's really the limitation of LSTMs or any gating mechanism based um, RNNs which were able to overcome the gradient, vanishing gradient or exploding gradient problem and a bit of a, the long-term dependency, but not, not really long-term dependency, I would say. So if you want to contextualize your text to the maximum degree, then you will see that just having RNN or LSTM will not be enough. That, so that brings us to the attention mechanism, which was originally proposed in 2014 and actually um, this was proposed in the um, for the application to machine translation using encoder decoder. It's something that we'll be learning later, but uh, we'll be talking about attention first and then moving to encoder decoder for the ease of explaining the concepts. The main idea of attention mechanism is we want to give direct access to all tokens instead of just nearby tokens for every token. Because RNNs or LSTMs every hidden state only depends, directly depends on the previous time step. 
that simplifies the model architecture. But because of that, whatever you want to convey from a long distance token has to go through several layers of RNNs or LSTMs, and your information might get distorted or it might get really, be, it might be very um, corrupted. That's a really the problem of long-term dependency problem. So what the attention mechanism gives us is that it gives a direct access. So schematically, we'll not be going into details in today's class. We'll be talking about the details in the next class is that you can think of this way schematically. So if you look at the current time step RN here, the, this, the, the output hidden state, this, this only depends on the current time steps input and also the previous time step, right? So it will not have direct access to anything before that. It has indirect access, of course, because your, your previous model will be depend on the, the more previous time steps, right? But why not give direct access something like like that? So this is a very um, weak, I mean, it's not super strong dependency, but still you're giving some direct access to the very other, very far away tokens directly instead of making them going through a series of RN layers. And it turns out that this idea is very useful. And in order to do that, of course, you cannot just look at them Every, everything, because if you just try to look at look at everything, then you'll be not be getting the information just you need because not you, whatever you want to do at the current time step is not dependent on everything in the past. It's only dependent or relevant to only a portion of, of things in the past, right? So you want to focus on on only a few tokens in the past, not every token, and that's where the term like attention comes in that you want to look at a few things. So basically you have access to everything, but you are controlling the influence of the previous tokens by the weights between the current time step and previous time step. So for instance here, suppose we have a three connections, then we might have the connection with the, the, the time step right before might be 0 0.1. Um, but you might have really strong connection with um, very far away token being like 0 0.7. And this attention has to be always summing to one because of course you can only attend on limited number of things. So I'll be going into details in the next class, but the, here's the, the idea. So up to now, I think it's a good time to really, I would say, wrap up what we have been doing until now and what they mean in the, the in general NLP domain. So, so now, now I think I can explain to you what I mean by task formulation model and learning. So we have been talking about a lot of different tasks and task is usually something that you want to accomplish in the real world. So sentiment classification because you want to classify each text into positive or negative. Machine reading because you want to do question answering. And I think you're familiar with the what the translation is. Basically, just translate English into Korean, etc. And language model, we haven't we have not gone into the details yet, but you can think of it as um, predicting what the next word will be. So something similar to I'll say at this point, dialogue generation. And in order to accomplish this ta these tasks you want to formulate the task into an abstract formulation. So we talked about text classification and token classification. We haven't talked about text generation yet, but in reality, really there are not that many types of formulations. What that means is that for, for most tasks, there are so many different tasks in the world. 
you can almost certainly formulate that into one of these things. Of course, um, to be more precise, you can formulate any task into text generation because everything can be in a form of generation, but you don't want to make into um, harder formulation than it can be because it just makes the model hard, harder to learn. And we talk about a few models. So we started with RNNs, now we're going into attention and we'll be talking about encoder and decoder. And then recently, most models are transformer based these days. So we want to definitely cover that. And learning mechanisms. We only talk about vanilla learning mechanisms, but soon you will see that modern NLP will be predominantly dependent on pre-training and fine tuning. And more recently, such as GPT-3, we have been seeing something like in context learning, which is a bit different from the previous ways of learning. So yeah, these blue things are what we cover up to now and the rest will be what we'll be covering in the rest of the class. So hopefully that was a good summary. So again, um, I'll be um, uploading the assignment tonight. So good luck with that, have fun with the assignment. And we'll be talking about attention mechanism in the next lecture. Okay, thanks everyone. Oh, wait, so I have a one question. So for, if you, in case you haven't, you are still here. The question was, is attention good for only machine translation or is it better than LSTM for almost, almost every application, I think what you meant? Yes, um, so, so I will say this way. So before the introduction of transformer, every model literally had, every state of the art model had literally had attention on top of something similar to LSTM. And Transformer is basically combining all the good parts from LSTMs and attention. So yes, so the answer to your question is that it is better than, I mean, it's not better than LSTM to be more exact. It's more of a, it's a complementary attention mechanism itself is complementary to LSTM. So we, you need both attention and LSTM. Okay, yeah, but um, to be more precise, transformer is only composed of attention mechanisms. So we'll be going into details what that means. And another question is, is a weight clipping performed in a layer wise or element wise? You mean the gradient clipping, right? Okay, yeah, so usually the gradient clipping actually is performed the um, at least not the element wise, it's at least layer wise or um, the entire model wise. Hopefully that wasn't, that answers your question. So it should be at least layer wise, yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, feel free to ask questions. And if not, I'll be ending the class now. Okay, see you next week.